Who's that? We have Inspector Pepper talking to my class love. And Captain Cricket with what my wife calls flying nun ears, which I think is a reference to her uh, childhood, something or other. I'm not sure what. <clears throat> All right, just going to give people a few minutes to roll in. It's a bit of a tight turnover from a uh, lecture, which we've only finished 15 minutes or so ago. Should we be showing our dogs too? Hell yeah. If you got dogs to hand, absolutely. <gasps> Doctor. Oh, what a beautiful dog. He's apparently got 11 breeds. 11? That's a good number. More than Mary, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Dixie, come here. No, Tucker, you had your turn. Come here, Dixie. Oh. Oh. What's the love? Oh. And then here's Dixie. Oh, that's a beautiful dog. Oh, they're all beautiful dogs. I brought one too. <gasps> Hello, Sean. Oh, look at that. This is yeah. bigger, like the county. Uh huh. Is he an old dog? He's about six. Oh, that's not so bad. What a beautiful pup. And Sabrina, <laughs> I can just see yours. Unmute Sabrina and it will. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yes, this is, oh, she's blurry. This is Lily. <laughs> oh, what a cutie pie. You can barely see her because she's so furry. <laughs> yeah, well, good for weather like today, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> and let's see, I'm not sure if Luna will be. Yeah, then. Wow, you got shots for sure. All right. Oh, and Sean's got another one. Or is that the same dog? Oh, yeah. No, that's a different one. This is a different one. I oh. found this one abandoned near the school. No way. Near campus? Uh, down the road a bit. Oh, well, good for you. He or she certainly looks like they're yeah, very, very happy that you did that. And here's the original dog. This is Mads and Luna. She was the one that started this whole craziness. And also I blame my wife too, because she convinced me to foster that we should be fostering dogs, and then that's how we ended up with two more. I think someone asked something about dog DNA tests. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I don't think they're a scam, Joshua. Uh, I think they're pretty interesting, actually. Um, I think that there's probably enough genetic differences beneath between breeds and different uh, markers because that's essentially what those DNA tests are they're not looking at the the whole genome they're looking at individual uh pardon me points in the genome that correlate to different breeds and so that's what a DNA test is for dogs really kind of similar to humans it's just humans are a little bit more uh more information <laughs> oh look at that that's a very cute picture Sean they're very happy. <laughs> um, so as long as those differences are somewhat robust, and I think they are, uh, then I think DNA tests for dogs are actually uh, pretty fun. I think they're largely, uh, they're not so much a scam, they're a bit more of a gimmick, I think. It's just more for your own interest. Like we wouldn't bother getting them done on ours because they're just mixes of, you know, who knows what. Uh, but the foster home that uh, we adopted Pepper from, the small black inquisitive one, 
um, they did a DNA test on one of her siblings and they and she had again like I don't know eight or ten different dog breeds so she's a San Antonio special like all of these so they've got lots of stuff in them this is just kind of fun really Sabrina you've got a second one got one more <laughs> oh. I didn't know if she would want to be on the camera but she does this is Casca that's a cutie what she is she is she Lovely. is a dash hound and a Australian shepherd. No way. Yes. <laughs> I've never encountered that mix before. Oh, yes. Definitely a San Antonio dog. <laughs> <laughs> so is she oh. very fast but low to the ground? Oh, yes. Actually, she's very, we like to call her a high rise. So oh, yeah? she's she's got very long legs. I don't know if she'll, oh, <laughs> very, oh, wow, very yeah. long legs. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes, she's adorable. Mm -hmm. Full of beans, too, by the looks of it. What's that? Full of beans, too, by the looks of it. Oh, absolutely. Big toe beans. <laughs> All right. So this is probably, it's kind of going to be a bit of an odd uh, lab today, obviously, because it's going to be online. Uh, but I've done this at least a couple of times through the COVID era. And if there is going to be a lab that goes online, this is actually one of the better ones for it to happen because we're not going to be doing any bench work. We use, we don't have to. Um, so, oh, that's a point. Shoot. I just remembered something. I completely forgot in all of the rush this morning to email the lab coordinator, the genetics lab. Hope she's not going to be too mad at me. All right, so um, essentially what we need to do today is uh, this is all about corn genetics. And stats. So also have um, other videos I can link to, I think maybe, I'm not sure. Blackboard doesn't really like YouTube links for some reason, anymore at least. Um, but this will go up online after class, or at least I'll be able to give you a link to it or something like that. And I've also got other um, versions from previous years too, which I can link to as well. So you should have hopefully uh, pretty good coverage of what we need to do. So, this is uh, something you can do all online. So there's uh, Simon on Blackboard. Right, and images that you can use to, uh, sorry, getting a little bit of a mm, reflection. There you go, that's better. Uh, and images that you can actually use to do the analysis. So the idea is to uh, kind of carry out mono and dihybrid crosses with corn, right? And so a big part of what I need to do today is uh go over these two um within a reasonable amount of time it's kind of a little bit out of sync so i know that we've start, done this and started this literally this morning uh in class and we haven't started this for the monday wednesday friday crew because uh, we just finished up the bit before this um so You'll both need that, but the plus is that we'll be covering that all for all of you before the assignments due, not this weekend, but the following weekend, right? So that will give you time to actually go over this again in class, ask me questions on the assignment and be able to do it before uh, the due date. We'll also hopefully next week be back in person, so you'll be able to ask me questions there too. Um, what else? And then we have the 
dreaded chi square test, right? Which is really all about did I get what I expect? expected. That's really the purpose of using this particular statistic, uh, statistical test. All right, so that's what we're going to cover. Uh, again, this will be kind of a work in progress in the sense because uh, lecture and lab are a little bit out of sync. They kind of go in and out of sync, depending on what labs and what topics we're talking about. Um, and we haven't covered this yet. But the plus is because we're going to cover this today when we get to it in class, you'll be a lot better prepared and it'll be a lot easier to uh, grasp or, or get a hold of. So, as with uh, the Zoom lectures, which we've all had uh, by now, with me at least, if you've got any questions or need clarifications or you can't read exactly what I've written, uh, let me know and I'll go back over it right straight away. These are also going to get posted to Blackboard after class along with the link to the, the YouTube video. So essentially on Blackboard, let's uh, sign into that first. There we are. <laughs> there we go. Share my screen. <laughs> Multiple dogs, they're very happy to be inside uh, on a day like today. So here we go. This is what we're working on uh, today, right? And essentially, let me bring up the actual assignment if I can find it. Deep D. All right, so we've got a whole bunch of background, yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. and for each of these, essentially, there's going to be uh, four sections of questions or things to do, right? Two for a monohybrid cross and two for a dihybrid cross. One of them is talking about cross, right? So essentially, this is a, you know, it's a dihybrid cross, a monohybrid cross, right? Ooh. Ah, gave you the first answer. Um, but there's a bunch of questions about the cross. So what type is it? Uh, give me the uh, words to describe the phenotypes. Here's a really important point, which isn't going to affect your grade. It just affects the amount of time it takes me to grade these, right? Uh, please use these terms when we're talking about the phenotypes right so purple for the dark colored kernels yellow for the light colored ones if there's even a hint of purple in it it's purple and then for the dihybrid cross uh they're either going to be smooth which look like this or wrinkles, which look like little raisins, basically. Please use those words in carrying out or answering these questions, right? So uh, over the years, I've kind of put in, I think, most of the permutations of uh, the different ways of describing those kernels. But if you, I haven't put in the one that you use, it will mark it as being wrong. 
right? So even if you use something which does a good job of describing it, like shiny, right, or textured, you know, which are fine, Blackboard will go, no, that's wrong, because it isn't one of the answers that I've put in there, right? So if you use the, the words that I've given you, you know, obviously the correct ones, uh, Blackboard is going to go, yay, I got that, and you'll get the grade. If you don't, then I have to go through everybody's thing individually and make sure I correct those uh, different terms, right? So uh, I'll still make sure you get credit for the work, but it's just a lot more hassle to do so. It saves me a bunch of time. Right, so the first half of each, uh, the mono and the dihybrid cross, is describing the cross, like phenotypes, genotypes, stuff like that. The second part is counting kernels and then carrying out a chi-squared test, right? And so the image that you can use, uh, you can use this one for the monohybrid. And I got, here we go, there's a real nice one here. Use this for the dihybrid, right? Because you can zoom this up on your monitor, right? For the monohybrid, you want to count uh, 30, 25, 30 kernels, give or take, roughly. For the dihybrid, right, because you have four different combinations now, right, which is what we had further up in the assignment, uh, to find or to capture the rare ones, which are going to be like that one there. I've got my cursor over. That's a yellow and wrinkled. Right, you don't see many of those right, compared to the others. So to capture those, you're going to need to count more kernels. So I'd suggest at least 50 if you can. And really, I just pick a row and go, uh, there's purple and smooth, purple and smooth, purple wrinkle, purple and smooth, purple and smooth, yellow and smooth, purple and smooth, purple and smooth, purple and smooth. Mm -hmm. You get the idea, right? And just do that until you've hit 50 or thereabouts. Right. And those are the data that you're going to use for doing the chi-square cross. So this image for the dihybrid and this one for the monohybrid. Okay. Anybody got any questions? So it gives me time to drink some coffee. All right, so the, and again, the questions in Blackboard, I'd come up here and start this as if I wanted to do it myself. Let me get this out of the way, right? They're exactly the same as in the lab handout. Right, and they follow the same format for both. What kind of cross is this? Right, what's the phenotype of the homozygous dominant parent? What's the phenotype of the recessive parent? So on and so forth. Right, they're exactly the same. And so, what the questions are, and, and this was a very deliberate thing when I put everything online for COVID, is I like the lab handouts. Obviously, we couldn't use paper, all of those questions. Uh, by and large, there are some exceptions, but all of them got, almost all of them got transferred into Blackboard, right? So they're exactly the same. If there's anything in your handout that you don't see on Blackboard, then it's not something you need to do, right? Because we didn't uh, cover that, right? So you need to fill out all of these. You've got four attempts. I think I fixed how to see your wrong answers. Um, before doing your second attempt. If I didn't, let me know and I'll fix that. Um, I'll have another, I think I checked, but I've got so much stuff on that sometimes, I'm not sure what I've looked at sometimes. Okay, so um, let's get back to this. Oh, wrong one. There we go, that's what I want. So the second part, right, where you, uh, 
Oh, good question. Whether to work on your own or if you can do them together. So my general rule of thumb is your work should be your own, right? So the answers that you put into uh, Blackboard should be the ones that you've kind of come up with, right? So you should be scoring these kernels yourself, right? You shouldn't be using other people's data. But for sure, work together to try and figure it out and make sure you get it right. So uh, that's it's kind of like a me, 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 kind of like a humming and hiring sort of answer, right? But you should be proud of the work that you do, but there's no reason why you shouldn't work with others to do your best work, right? It's kind of the way I look at that. Good question. And the same goes for the lab reports later on for the fly lab too. You know, they're your work and they should be, but obviously, uh, you know, you can talk about it with others and discuss best ways of doing it and share references and things like that. So the chi-square um, analysis is basically leading you through the process of doing a chi-square, right? I'm going to go through doing one with all of you, but the assignments are structured in a way that essentially it's like a hand holding, right? What's the first step? It's collecting data, right? What do you do first? You calculate the expected numbers. Take those, put them into uh, the assignment. Then you do the chi-square, take that, put that into the assignment. And so obviously everybody's results are gonna be different. And this is the same in person or not, because you're gonna be counting different parts of the kernel, you're gonna be counting different numbers, so on and so forth. So what I'm looking for in terms of grading and all of the chi-squared part is graded manually by me, is consistency, right? So I'm not gonna check the, ah, oh, for some of them I might, but generally speaking, I don't check chi-squared table. What I look for is, do you have a small chi-squared value? Well, if you have a small chi-squared value, you should have a large p-value, right? And so as long as it's consistent, you get the marks, right? I'm not gonna actually calculate the chi-squared again for you to check that you've got every like last digit correct. But if you're expected or close to your, sorry, if you're observed or close to your expected, you should get a small uh, chi-squared value. If you get a small chi-squared value, you should get a big p-value and it's not significant, right? So there should be consistency. Right, so if you get a really small chi-square value, but you also say it's highly significant, you're gonna get the second question wrong, right? Because it is wrong. You can't have both of those. One of those things is wrong. I'm just gonna go with the second one. All right, so uh, make sure that you actually do do the chi-square test. It's not really hard. Uh, it takes a little bit of thinking, but again, we'll go through it. Uh, but as long as it's consistent throughout, right, you get the right numbers of degrees of freedom, uh, the p-value matches this, and your statement about significance matches the p-value, you get it right. So really, in many ways, this is not a complicated lab to do, and it's not uh, an especially hard one to do either. By and large, it should take you, or oh, I'd probably say 45 minutes to an hour to do this assignment would be my guess, roughly speaking, right? If you kind of get your head down, maybe take a coffee break. All right, so that's the kind of the format in general of the, uh, of the lab. So I'm going to, well, essentially now I've got three things to do. One, I've got to go through a monohybrid, got to go through a dihybrid, got to go through chi-square. Right. Oh, also, actually, before I do anything else, does anybody have any questions? Because I said that we'd have a chance to do this uh, for labs in general. Anybody have any questions or issues with doing the lab from last week? The assignment, because that is due this Saturday, the 4th. And so I like to give people the opportunity to ask questions. Some of you have already done so and produced beautiful looking graphs. 
Um, ask away if you haven't and you need a hand. Yeah, I had a question. Um, Go for for the E value, that's just the number of points for the female and the male. Say again, the what value? The N value. That was just, that's the number of points, correct? That, yeah, that's the number of data points. Okay. Yeah. I can't remember what it is. Seven, I think, maybe, something like that. Seven or nine or eight. But just count up how many things you have, and that's your N. That's your sample size. That's also the what the count function does in Excel. So if you type in equals and then count and then parentheses and brackets, you select the cells, it will count how many cells you've selected. Anyone else? And I'm again, having... oh, Sorry. go on. Up. I was it. having trouble trying to figure out how to add the two SEM to the graph. Um, I did do the vertical. Um, oh, that's right. It's two SEM. You're correct. Uh -huh. Go for it. And I was trying to follow the video, but on the video, it had a, a button for the error mm -hmm. to add that. And I couldn't find it on for my Excel. So, oh, you're trying to do this in Excel. All right. Let's. Uh, Oh, hey, that's funny. I said I was going to show you the, the data set that I've been collecting. I'll get to that in a second, uh, Marisa, because this is just fun. So this is what I've been doing for the last year, I think, pretty much. So I've been working on uh, some strains that a friend of mine up at uh, Texas Women's University, she and her PhD student were working on. And so, have I got it right? Here we go. So this is the uh, lipid staining, right? So all of these, this is wild type. These are all different uh, mutants, right? There's uh, nine of them, eight different mutants in total, different combinations of alleles. And then all of those, uh, as you can see here, they get averaged and standard deviation and counted, right? And that then over here, if I find it, it's around here somewhere. Here we go. Gets turned into a graph like that, which is basically saying, I actually don't really know what it's saying, to be honest. <laughs> I, I was like, hey. This is crazy to me. You figure it out. Um, but basically, it's saying that these animals have less fat, but it's like totally not consistent what's going on. And the error bars are huge. So, in terms of error bars, right? So, I'm going to show you what these ones look like, Marissa. And um, then I'll show you how to add them as well. So, if you already have them, which I think you do because you have the, the up error bar. All you need to do, let's go down here to custom. What you've probably done is you've just either in here, uh, you have only one of these selected, right? So if you only have plus selected, it'll only give you uh, the plus error bars. You need to have uh, both selected. That's usually by default. So it I don't think that's probably the problem. Um, another issue, maybe you haven't selected the same numbers for both the plus and the minus. And so when you go to, and this has to be uh, custom, right? So this should bring up this uh, box here, right? And you need to select the standard deviations or standard errors or whatever it is that you're using, uh, using that function. So you've got to select one, click OK, click the up arrow, select the other, and then click OK, and that will give you your error bars. So in terms of 
Oh, and he, he, he. It doesn't have the custom selection. Okay, so. Um, are you using an online version of Excel, Marissa? Sometimes they're a little bit different. Yeah, it's through um, Microsoft Office. Okay, so. Uh, bah, 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 bah. You know what? Let's see if I can change this to oh and finally also this is um i'm just showing off hope you kind of uh what would you say accommodate me maybe so this is these are all movement videos actually i'll show you a little one it's just because it's fun and um, i can because i've got all this stuff online so where we are, this is a particular strain, uh, which isn't a very happy or healthy one. Let's find a worm. Can you see this? So this is a worm wriggling around on a plate. And essentially what I was trying to do is measure how fast that worm was moving and then look at it two days later, which is equivalent of going from being a teenager to being middle-aged in humans and seeing whether that rate had declined, right? That's the kind of the point. And so all of these animals right so these are all the different strains these are all the different uh analyses right so I'm essentially showing you exactly the same thing that i taught you how to do i'm doing it all uh the same for my own work as well and then you kind of boil that down to these um averages so it's done five five different times uh, for all of the strains, for like 10 to 20 animals each. You take standard deviation of those, and because we've got five different biological repeats, then you take the standard error of the mean, right? And that then gives you something that looks like that, which I have no idea what it means either. So anyway, so it's just to show that this kind of stuff that we're talking about, and I'm teaching you, this is actually stuff that people do, right? And I just wanted to show you kind of what that might look like essentially and showing off a little bit just because it's fun. I don't get to talk to people about this much. All right. So what I want you to do, Marissa, I'm just going to uh, fiddle fart around with it for a second. Let's see. Aha, there we go. Can you share you bring it up and share your screen with me? That would be the most straightforward way of doing it. And then I'll see if I can figure out what's going on and where. And this will also help others as well who might be in the same situation. Can you see it? I can indeed. Okay, so I have this here, and then when I click the, the the chart, it sends me to the format, so I was able to get all the way down to series, and then I found the vertical error bar, but the error mount, it doesn't... Oh, it doesn't, to... give you, doesn't give you the custom option. Yeah. Hmm, okay, so... Uh, hmm... That is kind of curious. I don't really know what to do with that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'd like you to do is if you can send, send me. Oh, there you go. Richard might have an idea. So uh, go over to the error bars and actually click on it. So move your cursor over. No, not on the format chart, but on the actual chart itself. Mm. So now hover over the actual error bar itself on the left. 
So yeah, that's it. Click on that. And then right click on it. And then format. Oh, that just brings you back to the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are the other suggestions that people had? Last tab of the format option. Hmm. Could you do me a favor and send me a, uh, a link to that so that I can open it? Yeah, and of course. I, then I can have a little fiddle far around with that on my own time and then I can get back to you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because it's, I don't, I'm not super familiar with Excel online. Um, mm -hmm. And it, and each each version varies, right? It seems like, and so it takes a little time to figure out what's where. So, yeah, I'll I'll have a look and I'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, what is that? Oh, don't know what that is. Uh, anyone? Anyone else? Sometimes, I mean it. That's kind of what we have provided, or at least what the students have provided, and it's great to have it. But uh, that Microsoft Online stuff doesn't always have the exact same functionality as the standalone programs, which can be a bit of a pain. Okay, anyone else have uh, questions about the last labs assignment? Um, yeah, trying uh -huh. to grab it itself. So I don't really remember if you went over it or not. Hold on. Yeah, so talking about actually drawing the graph itself. Yes. In Excel? Yes. <laughs> okay, so drawing a graph in Excel is fairly straightforward. You have your data and uh, in your case, you're gonna have your two SEM, right? And so I'm just making some stuff up here so I can show you. Uh, what would it be? Let's say that, right? Uh, actually, you're not gonna be able to see what I'm showing you, are you? So I don't have screen sharing on. There's a comment in the chat as well. Oh, cool, Marissa, that helps. Um, yeah, so there's there's other resources, but while we're here, I might as well show you uh, two. So you select the data you want to graph, and I like putting it in this format just because that's what I'm familiar with, um, like old dog and his tricks and all that. So you select the terms and the data, you go up to insert, and I always do bar graphs. As I've said to other people, it's like, it's not the most elegant thing to do, but uh, it's what I've done for literally years. And so that's just what I do. So you select that, right? You're gonna uh, change the title. I'm usually not super picky about titles, but it doesn't hurt, uh, at least chart titles. So uh might buy sex for example what you do need to do is you need to add axis labels so if you go here or just select the chart in general and up at the left you'll have chart element and sometimes depending on the version you'll have uh the same over here or you can uh right click on it and it may be a, an option in there too. So you need sex. The lower one I'm not super bothered about because it's kind of self-evident, right? But uh, the vertical axis is important because that's what gets you your, uh, tells people what it is. And you also need to put your units in there. Units are really important because otherwise it could be measured in I don't know, bananas or marbles or, uh, I don't know, professors or whatever, right?
right? There's no way of knowing. Second thing is, is this scale is useless, right? So we want to change that too. So format axis. Uh, go over here. Uh, I'd probably put the upper bound. Oops. The upper bound is, I don't know, 175, let's say. And then the lower one. Yeah, that's fine. It kind of does it automatically. And the it also changes the increments on the left that you see here automatically too. But you can change that if you want. If you want it by five, for example, that looks better to you. It doesn't really uh, make a huge difference. Right, so that's the um, basic outline. You can do other stuff to it. I always do just because I have particular uh, likes and dislikes for my own graphs. But I, other than that, I'm not like super, super bothered. Um, and then the other thing you need to do are error bars. And so again, as Marissa's found, it varies from version to version of Excel. Excel um, what you can do. I think there might even be, uh, I think it's Google Sheets, uh, free online version. And that may also have um, the ability to do stuff like this as well. I'm not familiar with that at all. So you go down to error bar options, which is going to be over here underneath the picture of me. Mm. Let's stick you over there. And then scroll down to the last option, which is custom. That gives you a like this radio box is what they call it. You select the up, and then you select the column with the oops, too many. There you go. With the plus or well, the two SEMs here, right? You also need to do the same for the lower bar as well, right? And then you just click OK. So that's the reason why you have to have everything in the same layout. Because if you don't, let's say you had it going like left to right instead of up and down, you're not going to be able to do this because it's not going to work. Right. And this also changes the upper and low limit because now we actually kind of encroach on that with the error bars. Uh, so you can change those back if you want. Doesn't matter. Right. After all of so this is like the the minimum. If I was doing it for myself, there's lots of different things that I do. I change the colors. I do. Uh, <laughs> hey, Ronnie, I saw that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, don't you go messing around with my 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 Excel file. Um, all of that stuff is just personal preference. Right. This is what you need to do. It's OK, Ronnie. <laughs> I did see what was looking like a cat's head, though. So that was that was kind of funny. Um, yeah. Does that answer your questions, Benny? It does. But um, when I'm trying to follow you and do it, it's not giving me that graph, per se, if that makes sense. Like that okay. graph. So. In the sense that you don't have a bar chart, instead you have, uh, I don't know, other form of chart. Is that right? Is that what yeah. You mean? Mm -hmm. So again, I don't mind. I'm just doing a bar graph because that's just habit for me. So you can, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you want to fiddle far around with that. That's just going to cause problems. Uh, you can do this as just a point. So if you want to, uh, let's see. I don't know. You can do all kinds of funky stuff. What does that look like? Yeah, you can do it as a scatter plot if you want. I'm not sure why you'd really want to. And it doesn't bring up the sex here, so that's no good. Um, what else could you do? Can't really do a line graph because uh, these are discrete categories, right? They're not continuous. So that's not appropriate. 
Um, you can just do a simple line across, right, to signify the mean. You could do this as a point. You can have like scattered around there. Uh, as long as you show the mean, plus or minus two SEM with axis labels, you're good. What it exactly looks like, it's as long as I can understand it, it doesn't, it's not super important. Well, I'm not really sure I'd know what to do with some of these, to be honest. Yeah, but just select 2D column, easy peasy. Go with that is what I'd suggest. All right, I'm going to get rid of this because I don't think Tina really wants to see uh, that kind of stuff. Make sure that's saved and close it up. All right, I think we need. Yeah, any other questions you have? Just, uh, oh, Victoria, uh, good question. The, the data points are from the Blackboard assignment. So go into assignment, open it up, and in each question where I'm asking you the mean, median, standard deviation, stuff like that, you will see in the question itself the data series that you'll be using. And essentially there's two, one for male, one for female, and they just get repeated every time I ask you, just to say you're scrolling up and down. All right. <clears throat> cool, cool, cool. Any other questions? All right, like I said, if you've got any other issues, just let me know. And if if they are ones that are kind of insurmountable without seeing each other in person, then we'll just postpone the assignment date. It's not, it's not particularly uh, difficult thing to do. I just don't want stuff to pile up on you, which is why I'm uh, a little averse to doing that unless it's necessary. Okay. Oh, it's nothing so cute as a sleeping dog. So, monohybrid cross. Again, I'm going to do this in a slightly simplified uh, version. Uh, I'm going to use, hmm, yeah, I'm going to use corn. Right, because that I think will help given that it's going to be the same as what you're doing for the assignment. Obviously, as many of you know, <laughs> as Ronnie actually illustrated, which is kind of funny. Um, I use cats in class, but it doesn't really matter what you use, to be honest. So monohybrid cross, P0, F1, F2. For the one that you're doing in lab, Essentially, we have, and I'm just going to draw out single kernel. The, co the cobs that you're looking at are essentially a collection of the F2. Right? It's a little bit weird in that way, but what you're looking at at the when you when you score the kernels are individuals of the F2 generation. So. So I don't have a yellow pen, and even if I did, it wouldn't really help very much because you wouldn't be able to see it. But <clears throat> we have these two individuals crossed together. They are going to be, uh, what color should we use? Mm, let's go with B. I like that. So we have a homozygous dominant parent, we have a homozygous recessive parent. As I've talked about with all of you before, that's always the case. Right? These are going to produce a, actually, let's make that a little bit smaller. Move it up here. 
heterozygous individual, which expresses the same phenotype as a homozygous dominant parent. And this is going to produce two different possible gametes, one with either a big B or with a little b. And so these get crossed together. <coughs> and so here's another F1, uh, right? We're gonna have, and always do it like this because this is actually a Punnett square, right? Which you should all be familiar with. And it's, neat because it helps kind of make things really nice and clear and then when it comes to actually working out the f2 progeny or the possible f2 progeny right because this is essentially what we expect you're going to have one homozygous dominant two heterozygotes and one homozygous recessive. And when you actually score these, right, you're looking for all of the ones with a dominant allele. It's going to be this one, got two, this one, because it's got one, and so on. Those are going to be dominant phenotypes. So you're going to have three black or purple or purple, actually, got to use the right terms, and uh, one yellow kernel. Obviously, you're not going to be counting four kernels, and even if you did, you might not get this ratio just because you're counting too few. Your sample size is insufficient. And so that's why when you do this uh, for the assignment, you need to count at least 25 kernels to stand a good chance of getting decent numbers of the homozygous recessive. And so these individuals here, those are the F2. Oops. These ones here. Right. And these are. I don't know what's up in my throat. A bit of a tickle. These are oops, auto allele writing. You're expected, right? And we're going to use this term because we're going to use this a lot later on for the chi squared test. So, can you all see that okay? There we go. So that is a monohybrid cross. Again, we'll go through it for any of you that haven't had this yet <coughs> in a lot more detail uh, in class. All right, so this is a monohybrid cross. In terms of corn genetics, you're going to be doing oops, purple versus yellow all right it's really quite a straightforward cross you only have one gene involved and two alleles so uh, it's relatively straightforward does anybody have any questions before we move on New. Oh, can I take a picture of this? That would have been a pain. Would have had to draw that out all over again. Okay. So things get more complicated with a dihybrid cross by. A fair bit. And so now we have two traits. 
and really in Mendelian inheritance, we're talking about two genes. We have uh, kernel color <laughs> and kernel shape. So you see how the whole cat genetics with uh, long hairs, short hairs, and different color is actually uh, pretty similar. So color is the same, purple or yellow, shape is wrinkled or smooth. Now, the thing that where it gets complicated is that you have to give the phenotype for both of these traits for every kernel. So you can't just say these kernels are purple, these other kernels are wrinkled or smooth, let's say. You have to say this kernel is both purple and smooth or yellow and smooth, or whichever. So there are four different combinations of these four phenotypes that you will see in the F2 generation. You won't see them before then because of the way that the cross is structured. But in the F2, you'll have four different combinations of these. Right, essentially, uh, that one, that one, that one, and that one, right? All different possibilities. Let me take a picture of that. And another thing that you absolutely have to do in a dihybrid cross is make sure you keep track of the alleles for both of those uh, genes, both of those traits. All right, so same layout as before. Same principles as before, right? Nothing really has changed. The only thing that's changed is now we have an additional gene to uh, follow, to take into account. So now we have purple smooth. So we, again, like I said before, you have to give the phenotypes for both traits, right? You can't just give one. You also have to do the same for the genotypes. So this individual would be, uh, I'm going to do R from wrinkled because W and S aren't very fun. Right. Same principles apply with all Mendelian crosses. Parent is one parent is homozygous dominant. And I do that for uh, typically both being dominant. It doesn't actually have to be that way. It just makes things a little bit simpler, less chance of confusing. So the other parent is going to be the opposite. This one is going to be yellow. Right, which is the other phenotype for kernel color and wrinkle. Okay. Same thing again with the genotype. It's going to be the homozygous recessive. Okay. That clear? So far, so good. In the beginning, it's you know it's not too tough. It gets harder later on. Cool. Now, as I've said to some of you, and I will be saying to the rest of you, I like writing down the gametes because it forces me to think about what's happening at each stage. In a monohybrid cross, it's a little bit uh, 
unnecessary, but a good habit. In a dihybrid cross, it's a really good habit. Right? And so this individual can only ever produce gametes with a dominant B and a dominant R. Can't do anything else because those are the only alleles that it has, right? Also, make sure when you do this, you have one of each. So you have a, an allele for the B gene and an allele for the R gene. Not two Bs or two Rs. It has to be one of each, right? That's a very common mistake to make, right? I want to kind of make sure you don't make it because. It will really mess you up if you do, at least in terms of mendelian cross. The rest of you will be fine. All right, so same deal for the double homozygous recessive parent. These two come together and gives you a heterozygote for both of those uh, genes, right? Because you get a dominant allele for B from one parent, you get recessive allele for B for the other, two together gives you one of each equals heterozygous. And because you have one dominant allele for each gene, the F1 is always or expresses the same phenotype as the dominant parent, just as it does with the monohybrid cross. Like so. All right, so, so far, relatively straightforward, where it gets. Alexa, stop. <sighs> This was terrible when I actually had a student called Alexa in one of my classes. That thing wouldn't shut up. Give me a second. Oh, I know cricket. I know. Alexa? Back I come. Oh, dog has a stretch. There we go. No more Alexa telling me what the joke of the day is. So same principles apply when we, oh, <laughs> that's funny. I think they're kind of neat, but they're also a giant pain in the ass as well. Uh, same principles apply for the F1 in terms of the alleles it produces or the gametes it produces. But now it's complicated by the fact that we have two different alleles for each of these genes. All right. So it's not going to be simple like this. It's going to be much more complicated. This is where things get nutty for a dihybrid cross. Okay, so essentially we have two F1s. Being mated together. That's what gives us the F2 generation. Now, because we have two different alleles for each gene, and we've got two genes, it's two to the power of two. So we have four different possible gametes. And you can do, I like doing this with by fingers, right? Because it's, I know it's like following along when you're reading kind of thing. So first possibility is big B, big R. Remember, you have to have one letter of each gene. Two letters of the same gene is a no-no, right? Can't happen. So we have big B, big R. That's one of the possible gametes. 
we have big B and little r, right, is another one. So those are the two different gametes that you can get for the big B allele. It's going to have the big R or the little r, essentially. It's another way of looking at the same thing. Now for the little b allele, we have same again, little b, uh, if you can see that clearly enough, little b, uh, big R. And little b, little r. So same deal again, for the small or the recessive b allele, you have the two different options for the R allele. And because you're crossing together two F1s, you do the same down here as well. Essentially, they are identical, the F1s. This is going to look a little tricky. Drawing it out sideways, but we'll, we'll do our best. This is where things get sketchy. All right. Well, that is totally not even, but it will do. And then when you do the, essentially the fertilization, right? You're going to be adding gamete from this list to a gamete from this list to fill in the individual cells. That's going to give you 16 possible combinations of alleles. Oh, I've got to change in the back. Being old. All right, any questions so far? Is this more or less making sense? Before I know it's a little bit faster than what I do it in class, uh, but you get the benefit essentially of doing it twice because we will be doing this in class as well. All right, so this is relatively straightforward now. You just add these gametes together. So, and you can, I would strongly recommend you do the same. And the reason is it's just, again, like note-taking, it's muscle memory, right? I've done this loads of times. I wouldn't be able to tell you without looking what they are. So I do actually check while I'm doing this. but it's pretty straightforward. The only downside is obviously my writing. <laughs> Not the most exciting thing you'll be doing all day today. It is a good thing to be doing. And this is also why I like doing this kind of work through with you, because it's it is a little bit, you know, kind of like puttering between the lines sort of stuff. But you can't get it wrong, right? It is about the closest thing in biology to not being able to get something wrong as you can get. Because uh, biology is full of, you know, caveats and weird stuff happening. But really, Mendelian, let's make sure I get these right. Uh, genetics is, it's actually more like math, to be honest, in my mind. Less like biology, in a sense. There we go. 
So these are all the different genotypes you can get from crossing these two individuals together. But we don't care about the genotypes, we care about the phenotypes, right? Because that's what you see. And so what you're going to do now is you're going to look for, at both of these genes. And if a dominant allele is present, it expresses the dominant allele for that gene. Right, so you can express a recessive for one and dominant for the other, right? You can get different combinations. We'll see that in a moment. And so we just go through all the way through here. So these are the dominant pair of phenotypes. We've got purple, actually, I have a purple pen. Didn't think of it. So dark, let's say. Uh, and we just go through looking for all of those which have at least one dominant allele for both, which I think, yeah, there we go. So there should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whew, that's a relief. There should be nine of those. Right, this is where we get the nine to three to three to one allele from. So now I'm gonna be looking for a dominant allele for color. So essentially these are gonna be purple kernels and a homozygous recessive for shape. These will be wrinkled. So that'll be one. So you see it's homozygous, well, it's got a dominant allele. It doesn't matter whether it's homozygous, dominant or heterozygous, as long as it has a dominant allele. But it's recessive for the shape. We've got the same over here. And there's one down here as well. There you go. The opposite to that is a kernel that is yellow but smooth, right? So this is going to be homozygous recessive for color. So it would be lowercase b, lowercase b, and have a dominant allele for shape. So capital R. And so you get that here, here. Oh, before I forget, we have three of these. We have three of these, right, which are yellow and wrinkled. And the last is, oh, hang on. Ha ha ha. Call myself a mistake. Sorry, everybody. I was doing that wrong. And what it should have been is we had a dominant allele for shape. Right, so it's not going to be wrinkled, it's going to be smooth. There we go. Right, got to read it right. It's a mistake I made. So now you have a yellow smooth kernel. Right, these two, these are new combinations that you don't see in the parents or the F1. And the last one is yellow and wrinkled because it's homozygous recessive, both. And of those, you only get one, right? That's it. So that's all of these individuals here. Those are the F2s or the possible F2s, right? Again, this is a mathematical deal. It's not certainty. And if you count enough of them, you should get something close to this ratio. Right, that's what you expect. Right, that's the expected uh, ratio of offspring. Right, so that's a dihybrid cross. I'm going to leave that up for a little bit. Uh, say hi to my rather sad looking puppy. Beep, beep, do. And 
I'll clear that off in a in a little bit so that you have time to kind of catch up and make sure we're all in the same place. Yeah. You have the mud. Tell you, these wet days are terrible for the state of our floor. We have three dogs that chase each other around the muddy garden. We try and catch them and clean their paws off before they come inside, but we don't always uh, succeed. Okay, questions anybody? Anybody and everybody. What's up, girl? Cricks? Cricket. Come here. Funny, this is our longest leg dog, and she completely sucks at jumping up on stuff. Come on, then. She's very cute, though, so I kind of forgive her for it. She might be telling that she needs to go outside. I'm just going to go take her outside in case she needs a pee. Oh, no, she's gone upstairs. All right. Again, this is one of those things that when you look at it like this, it looks terrifying and scary. But when you work through it, starting with the genotypes of the F1 parents, their possible gamete combinations, right, or allele combinations in the gametes, and then you add those together, and then you read off of the genotype to figure out the phenotype, even if, like me, sometimes you get a little bit wrong, it's you get it right every time, right? It's kind of like a self-correcting uh, issue. So one thing that is really, really important for understanding the chi-squared test is that this, particularly this, right, this ratio is a mathematical thing. It's not a biological thing. So this is what you would expect if this happens perfectly, like every time. But each individual offspring, each kernel or each cat or each human, right, is an individual, right? So essentially what you have is a probability that any given individual will have one of these four different phenotype combinations. And so for any given kernel, nine, you have a nine sixteenth probability, so more than half, that it will be a purple smooth kernel. You only have a one in sixteenth probability that it's going to be a wrinkled yellow kernel right so most of the kernels you see should be purple then about third in number of those right are either going to be uh black and wrinkled or yellow and smooth and the 16th should be yellow and wrinkled but biology is not mapped Right, so biology is noisy. If you every single kernel, you're essentially rolling the dice, right? Like you're a craps table or whatever kind of table that involves rolling dice. I don't actually know. I've been to a casino. But every time you have a fertilization event, it could be any one of these four gametes getting together with any one of these four gametes. 
And so you're not going to get a perfect nine to three to three to one ratio when you look at the population, right? Because you may have by chance slightly more of these or slightly more of these or whatever, right? Just by biological chance, noise. I would like the term noisiness. Biology is noisy, right? It's never, well, very rarely ever precise, simply because it's biology, right? That's what makes it so much fun. And so we have the issue of trying to figure out whether a deviation from this ratio, so say we get like, I don't know, 9.25 to 3 to 3 to 0.75 let's say, right? Does that ratio, that observed ratio, does it actually mean anything? Or is it just that biological noise that we're talking about, right? And so that's what a chi-squared test is for, trying to figure out whether what we get is what we expect, right? That's the key to a chi-squared test. Do we get what we expect? Or do we get something close enough that is good enough, right? In which case, yeah, we get what we expect with like, you know, some small variations. Or, and this is the flip side, do we get something that's different enough that we didn't get what we expect, that we didn't actually get this ratio and this whole deal isn't actually happening the way we think it is, right? That's the key to a chi-squared test. And if you think back to uh, when we talked about the assumptions of Mendelian inheritance, right? One of them is that uh, alleles segregate randomly. The other one is the, well, there's lots of them actually. There's no selection, sex is random, no mutation. But the other big one is that these two genes don't interact. They don't affect the expression of the other gene. Right. And so if our ratio that we observe is significantly, and that's an important word in biology, not like bandied around that actually means something very specific. If that's significantly different, then one of those assumptions is wrong, right? And we're trying to figure out in subsequent experiments which one is wrong, because it's not going to tell you which necessarily. It may do, depends. But either way, if we don't get what we expect, that tells us that some one of our assumptions is wrong. Right. That's really what the chi squared is all about. Is any difference that we that we observe from what we expect, is that difference meaningful or not? Okay. Keep that in mind as we go through the chi squared test. Okay. Any questions? Any questions so far? Okay, so I have a very particular way that I teach chi-square tests, works well for me and for most of my students, but it's not the only way to take to learn this. And so if something doesn't make sense, give me a shout and I'll cover it in a different way. So I'm starting to get hungry, I have to say. Looking forward to my lunch. So Question, did I get what I, actually let's put this in capitals, get what I expect, right? And so really what we're asking is, Is 
is the sum of differences. Oh man, I've run out of space. Sorry, really hard to write at an acute angle. Here's the sum of differences greater than by chance. So there will always be differences between what you observe and what you expect in terms of a Mendelian cross. Those differences will get smaller and smaller as your sample size gets bigger and bigger, but they will still exist. The question is, is the sum of all of those differences, right, for each different combination, is that sum going to be greater than what you would expect to get by chance? right just by random noise that's really what a chi-square is asking and so to do the asking i'm not going to give you so this is all laid out as well in the handout for the lab so that's another way of looking at this so i have my own particular kind of way of thinking about it And this I call Dr. Matt. I don't know how many steps are there. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, I normally put Peter in, in there, but I didn't have space. Five step plan for chi square success right so follow this every time and it'll work again it's math right you can't get math wrong at least not if you do it right so step one calculate expected values that's the first step. Obviously, ha, obviously you've got to collect data. That's really the first step, but that's kind of implied. So to do that, you add all your data together, right? then you times it by the fraction that you expect or multiply. And so this part is also super important. This is another point at which students often get tripped up. So you have to take all of your data. So if you've counted, uh, let's say, think of numbers, 28 purple kernels and 12 yellow kernels. You have to add those two numbers together. So all of the data for all of the phenotypes or phenotype combinations, you have to add it together. That's your total. Then you've got to mo multiply your total by the fraction that you expect to get of that total, right? So uh, let me kind of raise this up a little bit so I'm not kind of scrunching down there. So you get, you calculate, uh, what is it? 28 uh, purple and 12, no, you don't calculate, you score or you record or you observe. 28 purple kernels and 12 ye yellow kernels. All right, so total, 
step 1A, essentially. Pulls 40 in total. All right, so you have two phenotypes in the F2s, right? So this is your F2 uh, generation. If you have two phenotype combinations, what kind of cross are we looking at? Is it a monohybrid or a dihybrid? One gene, two alleles, two phenotypes. If it's one gene, is it a monohybrid or a dihybrid? Yeah, there you go. Oh, give me a second. I've just seen one of my cats. She only comes down. Gotcha. <laughs> she doesn't like being captured very much. Can you say hello? This is Noel. Mm, which is my cat, sort of, as much as one can have a cat. Hey, cat, got to get out of the way, though. That's it. Good job. All right, you stay there. I'm going to regret picking her up now. So <laughs> she is a pretty cat. Her sister, or sister, they were rescued together. Uh, Jasmine is even prettier. That one is my wife's cat because she doesn't uh, like other people picking her up so much. This one was always trying to find me and giving me love and so on and so forth. Jasmine is a lot more standoffish. And then we've got a cranky, weird ass old cat called Caramel, who is just a complete pain in the butt, like vomits everywhere. Anyway, cats aside, if this is a monohybrid cross, which it is, right? Again, so to those who said, <laughs> yeah, um, to those who said dihybrid, what you're thinking is, is that we've got two phenotypes, right? Two equals di. But every gene in a Mendelian cross has two different phenotypes, a dominant and a recessive one, right? Dominant being a uh, presence of a dominant allele, recessive being a homozygous recessive, right? So you're always going to have two different phenotypes. What you need to remember is the ratio. So what's the ratio of a dihybrid cross? Or rather, how many different phenotype combinations do you see in the F2? That's another way of thinking about it. So what's the ratio for a F2 of a dihybrid? Yeah, exactly. How many different phenotype combinations? It's going to be four, right? And so then you simply look at, well, you would if fluffy butts, but isn't in the way. How many combinations do you have here? You're going to have two. So it can't be a dihybrid cross because there aren't enough different phenotype combinations. All right. So next bit of information. Yeah, that's good. That's another way of thinking about it, right? Um, next bit of information we need. What is the expected ratio in the F2 of a monohybrid cross, right? What would you expect to get in terms of numbers? So Sabrina put up the dihybrid. Right, Joshua, it's a three to one. That's the ratio that you expect. Now, if, sorry, kitty cat, I'm going to have to put you down because I can't teach with you in the way. Yes, I know. You're super cute. Off you go. Bonk. All right. So we've got four, boss, there, four possibilities. Three of them are going to be dominant. One of them is going to be recessive. So if we turn that into a fraction, three quarters of our expected are going to be dominant or purple, right, in this particular cross. So that's the fraction, right, back up here that we use to calculate the expected. So we have total 
times fraction equals expected, right? That's essentially what we're asking. So, because I don't have no space, I'm going to rub that off. And so for purple, it's going to be the total 40 times the expected fraction, right? So three out of four of our kernels should be purple based on the monohybrid cross. Now you see why, why I did these particular numbers. Times three quarters. Now you could use 0.75 if you prefer proportions, it doesn't really matter. Okay. That gives you 30. Does that make sense so far? Well, now I was going to see what plants she can go and eat. Cool, cool. Now you do the same for the other phenotype possibility. So you use the same total, right? This applies all of this to both. The thing that changes is the expected fraction. So we have 40. Again, that's the total. But now we're only expecting one quarter or one out of four of the kernels to be yellow. So that is our expected fraction. And that, because I use nice big round numbers, gives us 10. So these, and we use very particular terms here. These are your observed data. And these, are your expected data. You've got to have that before you do anything else in a chi-square test. And is this only for a monohybrid? So the process, this step, is for any chi-square test. For a monohybrid, that's what gives us the expected values, like the, the expected fraction. So if we're doing a dihybrid, uh, doing a chi-squared on a dihybrid cross, one, we wouldn't have two different combinations, we'd have four. Second, the dominant dominant would be, instead of three quarters, it would be nine over 16. And the recessive recessive would be instead of one quarter would be one over 16. Because if you add nine to three to three to one, it adds up to 16. So that's the total kind of possibilities. And you'd expect nine of those 16 to be double dominant. Just as you'd expect three quarters of these to be dominant in a monohybrid cross. So the steps are the same, whatever you do a chi-square test with. However, the expected values are calculated based on what kind of cross or experiment you're doing, because that gives you your expected values. Does that make sense? Yes, I got it. Thank cool. you. Okay. But this is super, super important. If you don't do this right, nothing else works, right? So again, this, these expected values really come from your hypothesis, right? So you start with a hypothesis, you know, I'm gonna be doing a monohybrid cross. Oh yeah, this is just step one. Hmm. Uh, give me a second, Marissa, let me just continue my thought. Um, so you hypothesize it's monohybrid cross, it's gonna follow Mendelian principles, if it is a monohybrid, 
and everything's going according to plan, you would expect these fractions. And so you would expect these numbers. Okay. So yeah, this is just step number one, Joshua. There's a lot to it. But again, if you follow these steps, you know, as I'm doing them now, you'll always get it right. As for your question, Marissa, uh, the expected. So is the question, how do you know if these are correct or how do you know if these are correct? Oh, bloody hell, I've got a cat thrown up somewhere. Got to clean that up later. The fractions. So the fractions depend on what cross you're analyzing. So in the assignment for this lab, there's only two different crosses, a monohybrid cross and a dihybrid cross. For the monohybrid cross, you'll only ever have a three to one ratio as you're expected, right? And so this is really the, the ratio from the F2 generation that you expect from whatever cross you're doing. So when you're gonna do the analysis for a dihybrid cross, you're gonna be doing four of these calculations, right? One for the purple smooth, one for the purple wrinkled, yellow smooth and yellow wrinkled. And the fractions are gonna be essentially the nine, three, three to one that expressed as fractions. Similarly, if you're doing a back cross between two genes, you expect 50-50. Instead, your expected rate fractions would be a half and a half. That's why it depends on what kind of, what's your hypothesis, right? So you're hypothesizing you're doing a monohybrid cross. Therefore, you'd expect a three quarters and one quarter outcome in the F2 based on the three to one ratio. Yeah, so this is all just what you expect based on your hypothesis, whatever your hypothesis may be. All right. And you'll see we're going to use this later on for the analysis of the fly lab data. And our hypothesis is going to be different. So we're not going to use these fractions. We're going to use the ones specific to that uh, experiment. And you're welcome. So this isn't something that is like straight off the bat, easy to do. So it does take uh, a little while to do it. That's essentially why we cover it multiple times over the course. Also, this is something that you'll have to do in the exam, exam one for genetics. So kind of practice this, learn how to do it, get comfortable doing it and get comfortable doing it quickly, right? Because that will essentially get you kind of guaranteed points in your exam, right? Because again, it's not, it's something that if you do it right, follow the steps, you'll get it right. You know, it's not, it's not a matter of opinion. It is what it is. So step two of your, your five-step plan for chi-squared success, right? So now we need to calculate your sum of differences, right? So your ex expected, which color did I use? This one. Uh, let's do it up like so, just thinking out loud here. So you have two different phenotypes and you expected based on how many you scored. Now these numbers are gonna differ for every one of you, depending on how many of those kernels you counted. If you counted 28, then your expected values are going to be different. They're going to depend on that. 
So it'd be three quarters of 28 and a quarter of 28. I counted 40. So my expected values are going to be 30 and 10. If you counted 100 and went completely nuts at it, you would get 75 and 25 for your expected values. It's all same as the total times the fraction. And your observed are 28 and 12. So our question is, are these differences meaningful or are they just random noise? To do that, we need to calculate the differences and add them together, right? And so that's what our, most people think of when we talk. Oh, I didn't even spell that right. Differences. There you go. Defenses. That is like, I don't know, fence removal or something. So, In simple terms, chi squared is the sum of, which is written with a like a funky e. Hopefully you can see that. It's still getting a little bit of reflection here, I think from my side window. The sum of the difference is basically observed minus expected, right? Now we actually, so we put that value there. But because when you do that, you get a negative value for like the other way around. So uh, for example, purple would be 28 minus 30, which will give you minus two. This will give you plus two, add them together, they even out. So to get around that, the same as we did with variance last lab, we square it. Now, the more times you do this, the bigger your chi-squared value is going to be. Not because the noise is changing, but simply the number of categories is increasing. And so we have to account for that. And we do that. We divide it by n minus one, right? So that's the chi-squared formula. And you're going to do this calculation, this observed minus expected squared, for each and every different category that you're talking about. So for a monohybrid, we just have two. So you're going to do two of these equations, two of these calculations, add them together. That's what that funky E means and then divide that by n minus one, where n is the number of different categories. Questions? You said where n is what? The n is the number of categories that you are working with. So, or if you're talking about Mendelian crosses, you would be talking about the number of phenotype combinations. So here we have two, because it's a monohybrid cross, either purple or yellow. So that is our N. If we're doing a dihybrid cross, we're going to have four different categories. So our N would be four. Any other questions? Oh, shit bits. I got my wires crossed. Uh, I'm sorry. Scrap that. I was just double checking. Something didn't feel right. There we go. That's better. I don't know why I do this every time. I have a question. Sean, go for it. In question two of the lab um, says use one word to describe the phenotype using uh, uh -huh. the key in the background. What key is it talking about? Uh, that is the one further up underneath the first picture of the corn with the letters A, B, C, and D, I think. 
So okay, I thought so. So do you want us to just put A, B, C, or D? No, 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 no. Give me a second. Oh. So this is where I was just checking. I don't know why I get that uh, wrong every time. It's kind of annoying, but I don't use chi-squared test myself. What I want you to do is to use uh, the actual word. So if you have a purple kernel like uh, A, so this, this is a picture from a dihybrid cross because you've got four different combinations. For the monohybrid cross, you're only going to have two. Right, they're either going to be purple or yellow. So in that question, what was the question? What's the dominant phenotype? Uh, it will be purple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so for the dihybrid, you have to put the two phenotypes, right? So if it's dominant, dominant, it will be purple and smooth. Quite often, students only put one because they're still in the monohybrid frame set. But you have to put the two. Thanks. Yeah, so, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, sorry about the mistake with the formula. Kind of like every time I do this, I look at it as like, yeah, that doesn't look quite right. So you account for the difference by how big the number is. I'm sorry. Benny, we'll get to the, the number of combinations in a little bit. So you do that for every one of these uh, different phenotype combinations. There you go, that's better. Okay, so I'm going to leave this stuff up here and I'm going to use this space down here. And what we need to do is observed minus expected for purple. So observed is 28 minus 30 squared divided by the expected, which is 30. Right, so that's the calculation for this one. Then we do the second calculation for this one, which is going to be uh, 10 minus 12 squared divided by what's your expected? 10. All right, so that's going to be uh, 2 squared is going to be 4 divided by 30 plus. Uh, four divided by 10, which is, the first one's easy. Second one is, uh, what's that gonna be? 0.13, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Let me just double check on my, Pocket supercomputer. Hey, hey, hey. Got it right. Call 133. It doesn't really matter. So you add those together, and that gets you 0.53. That is your chi squared value. That's your second step. Right, so this is essentially the sum of the differences with a little bit of jiggery pokery involved. That gives you a measure of how different what you observed is for all of your categories from what you expect. Any questions? Do you need to see our work for the uh, goodness of fit test? Nope. I just need to see, for that question, I need to see this value down here. 
Uh, it's a little hard to see. What what is that? Is that the is that the actual chi square value? That is correct. That's the actual chi okay. square value. Yeah. Sorry about the legibility and scale issues. All right. So that's kind of the time, one of the time consuming steps. Step three is find your degrees of freedom. This is where we need the number of combinations. This is where I always get my wires crossed. And so degrees of freedom is N, which is the number of uh, categories or phenotype combos however you want to call it, minus one. So in our case, for a monohybrid cross, and you can just, you can even put this into the assignment now because it's super simple. We have two combinations, minus one equals one. And that is our degrees of freedom. So if you had 20 different categories, pardon me, your degrees of freedom would be 20 minus one, which would be 19, and so on and so forth. So that's super, super straightforward. That doesn't take any time at all. And you're probably getting to the point of I want to have my lunch because that's kind of the point that I'm feeling like I'm getting to. Last step, but one. Oh, badges, parentheses. Uh, oh, yeah. So that's, uh, sorry, Joshua, that's the number of categories. That's kind of the formal way of looking at it. Uh, so if you're counting, I don't know, uh, car color, right? However many different colors you've counted, different types of color, red, blue, white, black, whatever. However many different categories there are in your analysis, that's N. So because we're doing Mendelian inheritance, our categories are phenotype combinations. So in a monohybrid cross, they're not actually combinations, they are just phenotypes, right? So in this case, it's purple or yellow. So there's always gonna be two. For a dihybrid cross, we've got four different phenotype combinations. So the degrees of freedom or the N is based off of that. And it's always N minus one. That help? Yeah, that's all right. It's kind of like my arm's getting tired and it's at an angle and it's sort of scratchy and my right isn't the best in the first place. So, and kind of essentially, there's five steps for doing this and there's three things you have to give for a chi-squared test. Chi-squared value, right, which we calculated back in step two, Degrees of freedom, which we calculated previous step. And the third one is p value. All right, so p value is probability. 
that you've got that result by chance. And it's expressed in a zero to one kind of deal. So zero equals zero possibility or probability, really. I'm just going to do that so I can't stretch as easily. One is 100% probability. Obviously, you get something in between, right? So uh, it's rare that you get 100% uh, probability occurred by uh, chance. Essentially, that would be no difference in this case between your observed and expected at all. But most likely, it's going to be a proportion somewhere between here, between zero and one. It's never less than zero, although it can get very close to it. It's never more than one. And so what scientists have done or mathematicians is essentially drawn a line in the sand and said, above this, the result occurred by chance. Below it, it did not. Right? So. Zero P equals zero point zero five is the line. Right? I'm gonna take a picture of that and rub that off a little bit so I can have some more space. They're already finished note taken. Deciphering, maybe. Okay. So, essentially, we have a p value scale between here and here, right? The result you got was by chance equals not interest. Right, so also called not significant, significant. Now, if it's below this, and it can get down to like vanishingly small numbers using scientific notation, but there is this kind of line here, right? Oh, hey, love, you got a coffee in the coffee maker. Oh, Didn't have time to dish it up. Now, your result is not by chance. And now we say it is significant. That's why we get ever so grumpy when people use the term significant without doing statistics. Because in biology, this means this. Significant means the p-value was 0 0.05 or below. And obviously, the further below you get, the more likely this is not by chance, right? Above this line, we don't care. It's just not significant. Below this line, we do care because the smaller the value of P, the more uh, confident we are that there is a difference, right? 
potentially the difference is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's more and more and more likely to be uh, because of something and not by chance. That's what p-values mean. And so, oh, yo, yo, I'm wearing a divot in this couch. So to do that, where are we at? We want to, aha. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Uh, I should go back up here. This is uh, kind of varies. Like I've always used a table. And when I give these questions in exams, I will give you both the table and this chart because it may work better for some than others. What I've actually found though, is students actually kind of connect with this a little bit more easily. So that's kind of gone back to using this more than the table. And so essentially what you have are two values. Yeah, and I'll actually put these down in the chat. Okay. Right, so our chi square is 0.53, right? That's what we calculated. And our degrees of freedom is one. <coughs> so we use those two values to find the third value, which is our p-value. So what you need to do is, if you can all see my cursor down here at the bottom of the screen, you're going to be scrolling along here until you find your p-value or something close to it, right? So 0 0.05, no, 0 0.5, sorry, is about here, give or take, closest, it doesn't matter. So what you do now is you go up, right? So you follow this line all the way up, right? It's just between these two here until it hits the slope of your degrees of freedom, right? So this is in a sense, it's like an interpolation type graph, right? So this 0.5, it will take, hits the purple line for one degree of freedom about there, more or less. Once you've hit that line, now you go across horizontally until you hit the or the vertical axis. So you go along here, dun, 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 and that gives you approximately 0.5 for your p-value. So that's how you calculate the p-value for your chi-squared test. And then finally, I don't need to write up here because it's uh, just no words essentially. Then you simply state, is it significant or not? Uh, give me just a second, uh, Michael. Let me type this out. Uh, so, because essentially we start this whole process with a hypothesis. I hypothesize that, you know, I'm doing a, a monohybrid, or I'm observing a monohybrid cross and it's following laws, Mendelian laws, right, and assumptions, right? So that gives us our expected values. And then right at the very end, our p-value tells us whether or not we got what we expected based on our hypothesis. And so this p-value, 0.53, oh, sorry, p-value of 0.5, or let's type it out for, so you need to have three different things, chi-square equals 
0.53, Vf equals one, P value equals 0.5. And yeah, Michael, for our intents and purposes, all we care about is this line here, right? Between 0 0.05 and down, where it's significant, and 0.05000001 and up and it's not significant. When we actually do uh, statistical tests using software and the like, or R, if you uh, do that with um, one of our biostats teachers, you'll be given a much more precise number and that's what you would report. Right? It's what I report in uh, you know, stats that I do. But for our purposes, all we really care about is whether it's above or below, right? And so rounding it up, is uh, just fine. Uh, yes, Benny, so once you've got your chi-squared value, and let me just enter this. Once you get your chi-squared value and your degrees of freedom, you use the graph to get your p-value. And so it's fine to say, uh, because again, it depends on how accurately you draw the lines, right? How close you get. But rounding it, Michael, to 0 0.5, p-value 0 0.5, is totally fine doesn't matter whether it's 0 0.051 or 0 0.49, it's still not significant. And so that's what you need to do for your assignment and to do a chi-squared test. Ta-da! Follow all of those steps and that's really how I've laid it out in the assignment as well, and it will work. So the only thing is changing is that the first part of our um lab is the mono and then the second part is the die well you know i mean that would be me telling you how to answer your assignment benny so. i mean well technically you already did but you know like, i know i'm just joking <laughs> uh, yes that's correct um so for the die hybrid cross right key point your degrees of freedom is going to change because the number of categories that you work with is going to change and so when you calculate your p-value, you're going to have your chi-squared, but you're going to have a different degrees of freedom. Hey, I'll tell you another answer, fine, which is going to be three. So if it was 0.5 for your uh, chi-squared, 0.53, right? Instead of hitting this line here, you go all the way up to the third line, which is the three degrees of freedom. And then you go across to the p-value. So which line you hit depends on what your degrees of freedom are. That's why it's the second important piece of information. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. Any questions? I'm just going to take a picture. Yeah, on, <clears throat> on number seven, when it asks for expected counts. Uh, do you want an actual counts or the proportions? I want the counts. Okay. So uh, out of 50? If you count 50, yes, it'll be out of 50. If you count 49, it'll be out of 49. So I want uh, 33 purple. I don't know what it would be. 16 uh, yellow, for example. If you count 50. And if that's what... Uh, the calculations give you. So yeah, that's why it depends on what you do as to what values you put there. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Cool. And again, you know, this is the first time we've come across this particular test for most of you at least. Um, so it may not completely sink in right now, but we've got until like, uh, was that another 10 days, give or take something like that for you to hand this in. And we will pretty sure uh, cover this in lecture, but even not, we'll be able to cover it again in lab uh, in person next week. So Benny, uh, I'd suggest around 25 and around 50 for the two different ones, maybe a little bit more, but you don't need to do 
hundreds. You just need to do enough that you'll find the rarest category with enough numbers for it to be meaningful. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yes. Cool. All right. Again, I'm available by email too. So if you've got any questions, uh, give me a shout. So, um, and we can see in person after class, after lab, all that sort of stuff. All right, I've got to run. I need to talk to the. Uh, oh, sorry, Ben, you were going to say something. Um, I was just saying, um, for a lecture, are you going to upload both of these on your YouTube channel? Yes, that's right. Okay. So I just have one channel this semester for genetics for both, okay. uh, for everything essentially. Uh, it will be on there, but I'll try and figure out a way of getting that to everybody because I can't post it on Blackboard for some reason. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, it is definitely closed tomorrow. I'm glad they've finally got off their backsides and figured that out. Um, cool. Well, I've got to run because I need to talk to the lady who's teaching this lab after me, make sure she's all okay and everything. So I'll get this stuff. Uh, converted, uploaded, all the pictures will go up too. And stay safe, stay warm, right? Hug a puppy. That's the best way to stay warm as far as I'm concerned. Or, you know, a partner as well. It's another way. Um, and I'll see you soon. Cool. Especially everybody. Uh, Crook, I did uh, when I turned it in on the expected counts. I put in the expected counts if it was uh, four or sixteen for the mono versus die. But I'm going in and redoing it to the expected counts out of fifty. That's the only thing. Okay. I I did, but everything else should be correct. But I'm just going in and putting in the expected counts for the second attempt. That'll be the only thing that's different between. Okay. The well, I'm not going to look at this until after the deadline anyway so okay for sure all right you have a good one thanks you too man sean you all good uh yes thanks cool no worries i'll catch you later